Amen. Appreciate that. Jenny for playing, Brother Brady for singing. If you want to hear more of that tomorrow night, Brother Dalton, Brother Brady Dalton has a, I guess, a voice recital, part of his requirements here, in the chapel at 630. And if you want to hear more of that, uh, you're welcome to. We're pleased to have him on staff here. And so 630 tomorrow night in the chapel. Boy, and remember here at First Baptist Church, a couple of things. It's okay to sing along with the music. All right, this is not a performance. Performance time at First Baptist Church. We try to do our best and bring something excellent, but this is not performance. This is help lead us in worship. And so if you desire to sing, then you sing before the Lord. All right, I saw that, Brother Treadway. You can sing. All right, if you get going too loud, I'll tell you to hush it, hush, hush it up. If I can hear him. But uh, I saw Eric back there. You are singing too. And so, boy, you, you sing and just... Remember, we don't sing here for other people. We sing for the Lord. But you can sing and say amen. Hopefully hearts are touched by that. And you just be authentic in that. Boy, it's good to see you tonight. If you need a handout, raise your hand. The ushers and the men will come bring you one. Some over there need a handout tonight. And boy, I think if my eyes don't deceive me, I think I see Charmaine Turnbull back there. Is that true, Charmaine? Is that? Oh, God bless you. No, God bless you. Uh, having surgery here. I'm looking at this particular aisle with uh, your walker back there and Dr. Flanders there and my wife's cane up here. Uh, don't sit over here, folks. This is a dangerous spot right here. You be careful. But God's working great to see these folks. And I can mention so many people. Glad to see you tonight. Glad you're in church in the house of God. And, uh, and I shouldn't, but, but Mom, hence, I heard it was your birthday today. God bless you. Celebrating uh, the anniversary of her 25th birthday. The anniversary of her 25th birthday. And which anniversary you ask her, she can tell you. I'm not saying. I'm not saying. I'm not that foolish. Mom Hintz, she helps us in the office. I call her Mom Hintz. She is the nicest office lady that there is. All right, these other ladies, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for this all week long. Miss Caitlin's here, Miss Jackie, and, and Miss Debbie have been back, but, but, and Miss Mitchell. But, but Mom Hintz says the nicest things to me. And she helps us here, and I'm going to pay her until the Lord takes her home. She, she comes in, Pastor, that was just a tremendous sermon. That was a wonderful sermon. Oh, you're do oh man. She says all these nice things. I think she's a pretty wise lady. <laughs> I think that, that she shows true wisdom in her life. It's not a joke. It's true. You don't think Mrs. Hens is wise? Oh, no, she's very wise. And you know, she's so kind to me. We're glad you're here. Well, if you have your Bibles... Open there to Psalm 127. Have your notes there. If you need one, so hold your hand up. Thank you, men, for bringing those to us tonight. As we continue in our series on how the top ten ways uh, how to ruin your children. Kind of a tongue-in-cheek series, of course, uh, as we go through these different principles. We're on number four tonight. I did not list that there, so you're not discouraged on where we're at in the series, but I hope it's a help to you. And I believe that each week, as I bring some of these truths, they are not just for parents, right? They're not just for parents. There are truths inside of these principles that I believe can help all of us as Christians. So don't be mistaken like, oh, well, I don't have any kids. I don't want any kids. I don't want the ones I have. Uh, I'm never going to have kids or I'm done with my kids. Wherever you fall, if you're a child of God, I believe there's some help in here, though we're gearing it specifically for parents with a tongue-in-cheek way how to ruin kids. Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. We have a responsibility, a God-given responsibility, when God graces our houses with, with children to direct them into the correct way, the correct path. That is the idea in that verse, in Psalm 127, verse 4, about arrows in the hand of a mighty hunter. If someone fires an arrow, if someone fires a gun, they're responsible for where that bullet or arrow ends up. As parents, we, are, we have a great deal of responsibility in the lives of our children. Now, I understand that every child, every person, has to make their own decisions. Before the Lord, we'll be accountable before Jesus Christ, right? We must all stand before Jesus Christ, all of us. But as parents, we have a tremendous weight on our shoulders that I believe only God can accurately help guide us. Four principles there. We've gone over them every week. We won't stop now. Four principles. They're, they're printed on your paper. Number one, very few people are trying to ruin their children. I've met one or two. Couldn't prove it, but I, but I believe it. I, I, 
I, I think you are just on a mission to ruin your kids. I've read about others. You've read about this in the news. People do awful things to their children. You think you must be trying to ruin them. But if we're honest, most people are not trying to ruin them. But some are. Not trying to, but they are. Number two, we are all going to make mistakes. I will lead the charge in the mistake category every day of my life. We're going to make mistakes. We are going to make mistakes. Number three, we must realize our incorrect tendencies, actions, and attitudes and make corrections. Basically, if you see something you shouldn't be doing, change it. Change it. If you're going down the wrong road, listen to the GPS of parenting. When it says, find the nearest spot to turn around, turn around. Right? How many times have you been driving along and using a GPS on your phone or in your car, and it has told you to turn around, and you've ignored it? Anybody? I've done it before. I know better. I can see where I'm going. I knew this could come to a sermon eventually. I was using Apple Maps a few weeks ago. Those of you who have iPhones and use Apple Maps, God bless you. You're going to need his help. <laughs> Here I was going down the uh, middle of, uh, of the night. It was about 10.30, not middle of the night, but 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, going to Flint to pick up my brother from the Amtrak station. If you know where that's at, then you know what circumstances I was in. If you don't, let your mind wander, and it was worse than that. I was following Apple Maps, and they said, turn here, turn here, turn here. And there I was, complete darkness. Over here, there was a whole uh, row of semi-trucks just parked. Over here, there was a little strip mall with those payday loan kind of stores. And I was in a deserted lot. In front of me, I could see the Amtrak station. The only problem was there was a fence and tracks. And I was on this side. So I did what any wise, smart individual would do. I pulled up my phone and I typed into Google Maps, how do I get to Amtrak Station? And three miles and eight minutes later I got there. Sometimes we treat God's word in our life like that. I can see where I'm supposed to be. I'm on this side, and I, I want that right there. I'm going to parent that way right there, except between you and that point, there are tracks and a fence. Listen, go to the Word of God. Find the path. All right, if it takes eight minutes and three miles, follow, follow God's plan and let Him direct you. That's number four. God brings practical truth and help from Scripture to parents. And really a broader statement to our lives. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It is profitable. God's word is profitable. It goes on to explain to us how it is profitable. And I would say it this way. It is profitable in practical ways. Doctrine and reproof. It ends that whole verse with this. That the man of God. Now, that does not just mean a, a, a man or a male. That someone who is saved, the man of God, may be perfect. That doesn't mean flawless. It means complete. Perfect, completely right before God. Perfect and thoroughly furnished. Completely equipped unto all good works. The word of God is profitable and it's practical. It will help our life and in this series, specifically in parenting. Lord, help us tonight as we look at these verses of these concepts. Lord, I pray you'd guide and direct. Lord, touch our hearts. Lord, if you'd show us ways that we're not doing it right, Lord, help us to have the humility and humbleness to turn and to do it with your help the right way. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Principle number four. If you want to ruin your kids, then never admit when you are wrong. If you want to ruin your kids, then never admit when you are wrong. Not if you are wrong, not a, but, but when, but when you are wrong. Or more personal, when I am wrong. Please don't, don't miss this in this series. I will present some truths, but I do not stand up here as someone who has hit perfection. You have to go no farther than spend five minutes with me or ask my wife, but I'm trying to follow the Lord. 
All right, so please, I'm not up here trying to say this, but this is, as we get to it, you'll see from God's word. But, but just, just don't admit you're wrong. You want to ruin them. Just act like you're perfect. Little phrase there you can fill in there, uh, a little uh, maybe in the more vernacular. Either you are, in the blank there, crushing it. Either you are crushing it, and that equals perfection. All right, someone does a great job, so you crushed it. Boy, you just, you nailed it. Maybe you older folks, you, you did a great job, but you crushed it. Either you crushed it, and that equals perfection, or you are being crushed, and that equals pride. And that's that verse right there. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. He crushes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So either I've got it all figured out. I'm crushing it and I've got perfection or I'm living in pride and I'm being crushed because God is resisting me. Never admit when you're wrong if you want to ruin your kids. Let me give you some thoughts under that because understand that this is an attitude that finds its roots in the very depth, in the deepest, deepest parts of our sin nature, pride. Rears up its ugly head on a regular basis in our lives. No one, no one likes to be wrong. No one in school gets a paper back from the teacher and sees red all over it with X's and lines and says, Yippee, this is my best day. I was hoping that I would have more red on my paper than my fellow student. No. You want to see just a few markings at the top. 100%. Good job. You crushed it. If your paper is marked up, you don't want to see the persons next to you with zero marks on it. You ever sat next to those people before? I had one in college. I had one in college. Sat next to, to a kid who was, who was quite, quite the intelligent beast. And uh, boy, would, would sometimes irritate me, sometimes frustrate me if I looked over and he had a higher grade than I had in my paper. I didn't like that. I don't like to have wrong answers. None of us like to be wrong. If you get pulled over, all right, you hope that the policeman was handing out Frosties for the day or that his radar gun is broken. But how many, or maybe you've been pulled over before and the policeman actually made a mistake. I was reminded of the time, it was a couple years back now, maybe a year and a half ago now, I was driving down late on a Saturday night. Uh, it was a men's prayer meeting time, but I got called to the hospital. And so I was driving across town down Dixie Highway about 11, maybe 11.15 11, at night or so. And all of a sudden, uh, a car, a truck went flying past me. I thought, oh boy, that's... That's crazy. He's really going down. He's really going really quick down Dixie Highway. I wasn't going very slow myself, but he was going real quick. And next thing I know, there's an officer behind me pulling me over. That's odd. So I pulled over. I, I thought he was going to get the guy who was speeding, but he pulled me over and comes up, and it's dark out. He, it was a, a place right by the, the rescue mission area, if you know that area down Dixie Highway. And so he shined his light in, in, my, in my truck, and, and uh, he said, Do you know how fast you were going? I said, yeah. I said, yes, sir. I said, maybe, uh, maybe about 42, 43 miles an hour. Huh. I don't think so. Try 75. Now, I might have been going 48, but was not going 75. I was driving my, my brother's Tacoma at that time. I had those big, some of those mud tires on there. And past 50, that thing would just howl. Said, well, sir, it wasn't me. And so he's giving me license registration. He goes back to his vehicle. I was a little perturbed. He was wrong. He was wrong. I was right. I'm, I'm falsely accused. I'm a martyr. I'm a martyr. Here I am just going to the hospital to visit somebody from the church late at night, getting pulled over. I'm suffering for Jesus here and falsely accused. Apostle Paul never had these problems. He comes back. Oh, four or five minutes later or so. He says, well, there's a... There's another truck going down there that they thought it was your truck. We thought it was your truck, but uh, it's another truck. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, it passed me. 
Oh, it said it looked like a Chevy Silverado or something like that. He goes, oh, it was a Dodge Ram. Sorry, it was going too fast, officer, I couldn't tell. <laughs> About 75, I, th- I didn't say that, I didn't say that. <laughs> he said, well, have a nice night and slow it down. Gave my stuff back. No, of course, no ticket, no. Just that verbal reprimand, apparently. Gets back in as he pulls away. He pulls away, and then a, a state trooper pulls away, and then a, I think it was a sheriff or a Saginaw PD pulls away. There's three of them behind me. Three. I didn't see them. I just saw the one light, and there they pulled away, and I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, I'm, you know, some, some criminal out going. I'm just a pastor going to visit somebody. I remember kind of thinking about this particular lesson tonight and how how the officer that night, and I don't, I don't fault him, it just happened to fit the, the sermon right, could not admit he was wrong. Right? Could not say, boy, you know what, sorry, Mr. Howell, here you are, just a citizen going back. Thank you for visiting people in the hospital. Sure appreciate your heart for others. Boy, we, we need more people like that to visit other people in Saginaw. No, 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 couldn't say that. Slow it down. How fast is I going, officer? You have no idea. You don't know. But parents, and broadly, Christians, can you admit you're wrong? Can you admit you're wrong? Some things that were inside of this, because pride will destroy our relationships. It'll destroy it with God, it'll destroy it with others and with our children. Only by pride comes the contention. Some deceptive thoughts. The first deceptive thought there at top of page number two. If I admit I am wrong then I won't have any authority. Boy, if I, and this is a deceptive thought, a wrong thought, if I say I'm wrong, I'm the leader, then if I say I'm wrong, boy, then no one will listen to me. No one will respect me. No one will give me any credibility. I must maintain a perception of what I think you think of me. It's not reality. We all know that no one is perfect. Can we say that together? No one's perfect. You say that with me? No one is perfect. You say it one more time. No one is perfect. Look to the person next to you and say this, aha, I know your secret. You're not perfect. Look back at that person and say, no, you don't. No, I'm just kidding. No. No one is perfect. What happens is we have, if we're not careful, a level of insecurity. An insecure, uh, insecure in our life that if someone knows that we actually make mistakes, then they won't accept us. They won't respect us. They won't listen to us. When in reality, the opposite is true. The opposite is true. That being genuine brings greater influence and authority. You can write that down, parents. Being genuine brings greater influence influence and authority teenagers you can write that down being genuine brings greater influence and authority in life being genuine by just saying listen my bad my fault yeah I was speeding or I wasn't speeding sorry I miscommunicated If I admit I'm wrong, then I won't have any authority. A deceptive, deceptive thought. Dads, you can admit you're wrong and be genuine, and you will find greater authority and influence. Because now your son can say, wow, my dad's a big enough man to admit that he made a mistake. You see, your son already knew you made a mistake, and you already knew you made a mistake, And mama already knew you made a mistake. And sister already knew you made a mistake. Everyone knew you made a mistake, yourself included. But we're deceived when we think, if I admit I'm wrong, I just won't have any authority in life. It happens beyond families, does it not? It happens on a job, at a job location, between boss and employees. It can happen in in that scenario. It can happen in the public sphere with a perhaps a police officer, and I'm not, I'm just painting with a broad brush, brush, I think you understand. It can happen, uh, it can happen at the grocery store, where a cashier rings you up incorrectly and it's your fault. You know, it's not my fault. It's not my fault, it's your fault. 
All right? But if I admit I'm wrong, then, well, you won't respect me as a cashier. No, it's fine. It's fine. Have you ever not had your debit card clear, get declined? Had this happened before? Remember, years, years ago, it happened at McDonald's. How embarrassing at McDonald's. It's declined, and, and here this young girl who, who, you know, in high school still, looking at you, down their nose at you. Oh, you're dead, but you don't pay your bills. I have lots of money. Lots and lots and lots and lots of money. See, here's my, here's my account. See, lots of money, right? You know, I, oh, somebody stole my identity. Somebody stole my identity. But you're wrong. Number two, the second, the second deceptive thought. Maybe you fall prey to this one. I am never wrong. I am never wrong. What are you saying when you say that? There's some blanks under there. Four, four blanks. I have never, I never have a wrong reaction. And bless your heart. <laughs> bless your heart. I never make a wrong decision. Then listen, if that's the case in your life, then please, I'm going to call you and tell me decisions to make if you never make a wrong one. I will borrow your brains if you never make a wrong one. I never perceive a situation incorrectly. I never perceive it incorrectly. What I see is absolutely valid and real. I know all the ins and outs. I understand the motives. I see all. I know all. Or number four, I never misunderstand someone's intentions. I know exactly what that person was thinking when they said that. I know. I was inside their mind, inside their heart, and I, I am not wrong on this. The issue is, sometimes we are. Sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we have a wrong reaction. Right? We have the Spirit of God living inside of us. We're Christians. But you ever respond the wrong way? Well, I was just tired that day. You might have been tired, but that's not the excuse. No, you react in the flesh. You allow the flesh to dominate instead of the spirit. That's called wrong, sin. That's what we call that in the Bible. You ever make a wrong decision? Boy, I should have gone right and I went left. Boy, I, I should have chose this instead of this. Have you ever perceived a situation incorrectly? Parents, how about you hear the kids kind of bickering a little bit, and, and we do our best not to let our kids bicker. I'm going to repeat that. We do our best not to let our kids bicker. You say, what? They're not supposed to fight? Well, the Bible says only by pride cometh contention. So you can't expect your kids to get along. And, mom and dad, you can get along. If you're not, pride's involved. I don't know about you, but I don't want pride in the house if we can help it. But I've perceived situations incorrectly. Hey, hey, Johnny, stop that. My wife's like, well, actually, it wasn't Johnny, it was Danielle. Well, Danielle, you stop that too. And James, for good measure, you better stop as well. Dad, I wasn't even here. You were probably thinking you were, all right? <laughs> you didn't just get a chance to open your mouth yet, boy. <laughs> I've misunderstood someone's intentions. I've misunderstood my kids' intentions. They've asked honest questions, and, and I've perceived them to ask a challenge question. I've responded that way. Wait, no, no, that's not. I responded incorrectly. I was wrong. I was wrong. Third deceptive thought there. I am the parent. Therefore, I am right. No. Being the parent does not make you right. Being the parent makes you the authority. But being the parent does not make you automatically right. There's a blank uh, on your paper. There are two blanks with a not equal sign. Authority does not equal right. Authority does not equal right. Now, I still am supposed to show respect to authority. That's from the Bible, God's word, show, show respect. But I don't get a blank pass just because I'm the boss or I'm the dad. 
For some, as parents and in relationships, well, the louder I get, then the more I'll show you I'm right. And if I just raise my volume, I'll, I raise my correctness level. I have yet to find, I have yet to find a legitimate place for yelling in a home. Now, some of you are like, aha, I know. All right, my two-year-old's about to go across the street, and it's on I-75. I happen to live on I-75, and there's no barricades. And they're about to cross I-75, and there's 14 logging trucks coming down the road. I can yell right then. Good, yes, yes, for safety. But right now, if you think that way, you're just merely bringing excuse to your mind. And you're purposely avoiding what I'm saying. There's not a place for yelling in the home. We got married. My wife asked, she goes, would you please never yell in the home? Now, if you know me, um, yelling's not my poison. And we've not yelled. I can think of one time I had to yell my wife's name. It's the time I cut my finger right to the bone with exacto knife as I cut toward my hand. And before you all stand in judgment of me, men, you've cut towards your body as well. It was a quick cut. It was going to be very painless and easy, and it was not painless nor easy. I was yelling at my wife, and, and uh, she's in the garage, and she comes in exasperated. What? And I was, you know, I had, was holding it. I said, this, and then blood's going everywhere. You don't have to yell in the home. Being the parent doesn't make you right. It just makes you authority. Number Number four there, well, if I just pretend it didn't happen, it'll just go away. And I find that this particular deceptive thought is one of the most prevalent thoughts inside of this idea. We know inside here that what we did was wrong. It wasn't the right reaction. We know that we reacted the wrong way, a wrong decision, wrong perception, wrong misunderstanding. But rather than face it like a godly, mature Christian man or woman or child, maturity there, will just pretend it didn't really happen and then it'll all smooth over. We just will kind of just brush it up under the carpet. If we do that, we'll just come back out and smiling, everything's A-OK, -okay, and uh, yeah, dad's good, mom's good, kids are doing, and that situation over there, that just we're just going to erase that from our memory banks. Except... The Bible never says that I get to cover my mistakes. It says someone else is allowed to in love, but I'm supposed to confess my sin, not cover my sin. In fact, the Bible says if I cover it, I will not prosper. That's what the Bible says. So if I decide to brush it under the rug, rug approach, what I will reap from God's word is a non-prospering relationship. You'll ruin people. You'll ruin relationships. You'll ruin kids. Young people, if you do this, you'll ruin relationships. I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to just pretend it didn't happen. We say things like this, well, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is to be correct before God. That's the big deal. So that before God, I operate according to his GPS, his guideline, his path. And he says to deal with these things. The deceptive thought says, I'll just pretend it didn't happen. And over time, you'll just forget about it. And we'll just move on. And I don't have to face it. You don't have to suffer anything. And we're just going to be real good about it. Number five, the last deceptive thought. Well, they're just kids. It doesn't really matter. Ah, they're three and five. Who cares? They won't remember anyway. Hmm. Or I put a little phrase here. I dealt with a whole lot worse from my parents. Maybe you did. Maybe you did. Maybe it was just horrible for you growing up, and I'm sorry if it was. It does not give me excuse to not walk in the Spirit. Let's quickly on that last page, let me give you the correct response. How are we supposed to respond? There are three verses here. Top of your page. You read them or read along with me. I'll, I'll read them out loud. You'll read them out loud. Ephesians 4.32. Very unfamiliar verse, right? Never heard this one before? And be ye kind one to another. Be ye kind, tenderhearted. And here's the key phrase in this one. Forgiving one another. 
Now, why would we have to forgive one another? Because people are going to make mistakes. Because we're not perfect. Right? Because, because no one is perfect. No one is crushing it. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. He says is, hey, listen. You've been treated awfully well in your life. You've been forgiven by God because of Jesus Christ. And last time I checked, that's a pretty good forgiveness offering. So get over yourself. Luke 14, 11, For whosoever exalted himself shall have authority, shall have influence. Is that what it says? No, for whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. If we believe this verse to be true, and I do, then in a home, dads, if you want to be upheld as a good father, then you humble yourself. That's when God exalts. If you exalt yourself, the Bible says, then you're abased. Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Three things that God emphasizes. The first one's already in your notes, my bad. God emphasizes humility. God emphasizes humility. He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. And being found, speaking of Jesus Christ, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I want you to practice this with me, would you? Three words. I am wrong. Right? I did not say I am sorry. I am what? Wrong. All right, let's try it one more time. I am wrong. How hard was that? Anybody fall over? Heart attacks? Earth come crashing down? Some of you are like, well, I didn't say that, that's for sure. How about these four words? Followed by, will you forgive me? Try that with me, four words. Will you forgive me? Can we try those seven words together? Can we try that together? All right, starting with I am wrong, will you forgive me? Can you say that with me? Here we go. I am wrong, will you forgive me? me. Powerful, powerful words, especially in a home. Especially in a home. Say, listen, I'm wrong. Will you forgive me? We normally go to not the humility part, but to the reason that we're not really wrong. Why someone else was more wrong than we were. All right, they were more bad. They were badder than we were. They made more of a mistake, and that justifies most of our mistake. So if they hadn't done that, we wouldn't have done this, and then, oh boy, they caused it. The only reason that I even thought to make that mistake was because they made the mistake first. We find that in Genesis, don't we? Eve, snake. Adam, Eve. And Adam, above all, says, Eve, God. So Adam says, the woman thou gavest me. So really, God, if you hadn't given me this woman in my life, then I'd still be in the garden. But you and me, God, hmm. Well, you blew it back there when when you gave me Eve. You really messed it up, Lord. I'm on your side. But God said, no, it's not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. I am wrong. Will you forgive me? God emphasizes humility. If you want to be exalted, uplifted in God's economy, then humble yourself. And we see that in the Philippians passage, we're further reading Philippians 2, the example of Jesus Christ. We don't have to go any further than that. Number two there, God also emphasizes honesty. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. 
And as ye would, Luke 6, 31, and as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Boy, that's a, that's a condemning verse, is it not? If you want kids to apologize, then if you want them to do to you, then you should do to them. That's what it says, right? So if I want them to apologize, then I should. We'll try it again. I didn't warn you there was a pop quiz. So if I want kids to apologize, then I should. Boy, that's weird. That's what the verse says, right? What you'd have people do to you, then do to them. God emphasizes honesty. Lastly, the last one, thirdly. God emphasizes forgiveness. Forgiveness. Matthew 18, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. I like that little question, till seven times, that Peter asks. Because I'm sure that in Peter's mind, that number was just over the top. Lord, how often shall I forgive him? Till seven times? Like, that's a number of perfection. Like seven times, I'm crushing it seven times. And Jesus, I'm going to maybe read into what Jesus says a little bit. It's like Jesus says, now Peter, that's so cute. That's adorable. Seven times, aw, shucks. Good try. You almost got it. Peter, how about you try 70 times seven? You could probably at that moment hear a pin drop. He said, what? He, he, he said eight times, right? Eight times? He said ten times. Seventy times seven? You want to carry the one? I'm a fisherman. I'm not real good at math. Boy, God emphasizes forgiveness. A final thought. James 3.17 says this, but the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. I think that'd be a pretty good attitude for us to display. Not just for moms and dads, but brought on that as Christians. Teenagers, grandparents, employers, employees, as customers, as citizens, that we display wisdom from up there. You want to know what it looks like down here, just turn on the news or read James chapter 3, I think it's verse 15 and 16, two verses before that. You'll find out what earthly wisdom looks like. It's shown all the time around us. Last phrase there, I desire to raise my kids in a humble, honest environment that they, by my example, can observe how to admit and acknowledge when they're wrong. Wouldn't that be neat? Son comes up, hey dad, I was wrong. Okay, son. Hey mom, I was wrong. Hey teach, I was wrong. God the example starts with us. Lord, help us as Christians to not be so inflated in our mind that we allow the devil, Lord, to bring pride and emphasize in our life. Lord, we need your help as parents, as Christians. Lord, that we would emulate your humility by your grace and strength. In Jesus' name, amen.